Most cells, with the exception of blood and metastatic cancer cells, must be anchored to each other and to the matrix if they are to grow and divide normally. They're joined by intercellular junctions. In this figure, you can see all three types of intercellular junctions. We'll look at tight junctions, desmosomes, and gat junctions. So intercellular junctions, in short, are connections between one cell and another. Without them, cells like muscle cells would pull apart from each other when they contracted, or every time you swallowed food, the food would scrape cells off of your esophagus. So intercellular junctions are involved in both resisting stresses on the tissues as well as communication between cells. A tight junction is exactly what it sounds like. It's a tight junction between two cells. It's a region in which adjacent cells are bound together by fusion of the outer phospholipid bilayers of their plasma membranes. In epithelia, it forms a zone that completely encircles each cell near its apical pole. You can see the tight junctions right here. It seals off the intercellular space, so nothing can pass between the cells. This makes sense, like if you think about the digestive system, if the cells weren't anchored to each other by tight junctions, then food could just pass between the cells. We want food to be absorbed into the cells and then processed in the cells and then the resulting components to be secreted on the other side of the cell. So tight junctions hold cells tightly together and don't permit anything passing between the cells. Desmosomes are another type of cell junction. They are like little rivets that hold the cells together, like a snap on your clothing. We can see desmosomes here. There are these button-like structures. They serve to keep cells from pulling apart, but they allow passage of materials between the cells. They actually have J-shaped hook-like proteins that arise from the cytoskeleton and reach between the plasma membranes and hook onto each other. Hemidesmosomes are desmosomes that anchor cells to the basement membrane. They're called hemidesmosomes because they're like half a snap. Here's an example of a hemidesmosome. It doesn't have a corresponding half on the other side of the basement membrane. Gap junctions are our third type of junction. They're called communicating junctions because they allow actual physical communication between the cells. They have a ring-like connexon. These connexons that you can see here actually physically allow a passage between the cells. So ions and glucose and amino acids and other solutes can pass from one cell to the other. As ions pass, we'll see electrical membrane potentials passing, and this is how heart cells communicate with each other, through gap junctions. The signal is passed from one cell and causes progressive contraction of downstream cells. So take a moment here and review the three types of intercellular junctions. Tight junctions, desmosomes, and gap junctions. Write down some characteristics of each. So let's move on to glands. A gland is a cell or organ that secretes substances for use elsewhere in the body, or it releases them for elimination from the body. The gland product could be something like digestive enzymes, which are synthesized by the gland cells, or it could be something that's been removed from the tissue, such as we see in sweat glands. Glands are usually composed of epithelial tissues on a supporting framework of connective tissue. Exocrine glands maintain their contact with the body surface by way of a duct, an epithelial tube that's going to convey the secretion to the surface. Endocrine glands are not connected to a surface at all. That is, they have no ducts. They secrete their products directly into circulation. The thyroid gland, the adrenal gland, and pituitary glands are great examples. Some organs we'll see have both endocrine and exocrine function. So that is, they secrete things through ducts to an outside surface, and they secrete substances into the blood. The liver, the gonads, and pancreas are great examples of this. 
Keep in mind that the surface could be an internal surface, such as we see with the pancreas secreting digestive enzymes into the small intestine, or they could be to the outside, like we see with sweat glands, dumping sweat to the outer skin surface. There are unicellular glands. They're found in the epithelium that is predominantly non-secretory. They can be endocrine or exocrine. The mucus secreting goblet cells or endocrine cells in the stomach and small intestine are great examples of these unicellular glands. The exocrine gland structure is pictured above here. There's a capsule with a connective tissue covering. And there are different septa or trabeculae. These are extensions of capsule that divide the interior gland into lobes or compartments. Those are often further divided into smaller lobules. The stroma is the connective tissue framework of the gland. It supports and organizes the glandular tissue. The parenchyma are the cells that perform the task of synthesis and secretion. So parenchyma cells are involved in actual secretion, whereas stroma is connective tissue framework. The parenchyma cells are typically cuboidal or simple columnar epithelium. There are several different types of exocrine glands. There are both simple and compound ducts, and then each of these have various shapes. So simple are unbranched ducts, and compound are branched ducts. We can see those two shown here. The shape of the gland could be tubular, which is where the duct and secretory portion have a uniform diameter as shown here in this simple coiled tubular duct. They can be acinar, which is where they form a dilated sac or acinus or alveolus at the end. These are acinar shapes, so this is a compound acinar duct. Or you could have tubulo acinar, where we'll see both a tubular and acinar portion of secretory cells. There are several different types of secretions we'll see from glands. Serous glands will pro produce thin, washery secretions like perspiration, milk, tears, and digestive juices. Mucous glands will produce much more glycoprotein and mucin. This absorbs water to form a sticky secretion called mucus. An example of these are the goblet cells. They're unicellular mucous glands. There are also mixed glands. They contain both cell types and produce a mixture of both serous and mucus secretions. There are also cytogenic glands that actually release whole cells. Sperm and eggs are great examples of this, coming from the ovaries and testes. So there are several different methods of secretion. In mirocrine glands, there are vesicles that release their secretion by exocytosis. So the cell produces the product and then releases it into the lumen by exocytosis. Some glands, such as axillary, like armpit sweat glands, and mammary glands, are named apocrine glands. This is from a former belief that they used to drop off a portion of their apical surface into the lumen. However, further investigation has shown us that these apocrine glands have primarily a mirocrine mode of secretion. Mirocrine secretion, again, being that they release their contents by exocytosis into the lumen of the gland for secretion through the duct. Then there are halocrine glands. Halocrine glands will see cells accumulating a product and then the entire cell disintegrates. You see a secretion of mixture of cell fragments and the synthesized substance. Oil glands in the scalp and glands of the eyelids are examples of halocrine glands. So take a moment here to close your book and review all that we've learned about glands. Consider the two types of glands, simple or compound, and then the different shapes, tubular, acinar, or mixed, as well as the two different methods of secretion, both mirocrine and halocrine. So in chapter one, we considered some of the body cavities and all the different membranes that lie them, the parietal and serosal layers. 
Now let's take a look at the histology of some of these membranes. The cutaneous membrane is the skin. It's the largest membrane in the body. It's predominantly stratified squamous epithelium of the epidermis over a connective tissue in the dermis. It's a relatively dry membrane layer and serves a protective function. Then we have mucose membranes, the mucosa. These line the passageways that open into the external environment, such as the digestive tract and respiratory tract. Serous membranes are internal membranes. There's simple squamous epithelium over areolar tissue. They produce a serous fluid that arises from a blood and they cover the organs and line the walls of the body cavities. These are the membranes that we looked at in chapter one. Endothelium lines blood vessels and the heart, and mesothelium lines the body cavities, like pericardium and peritoneum and all the pleural membranes. We'll also see synovial membranes. These line joint cavities. They're a connective tissue layer and that secretes synovial fluid. So here's the basic structure of a mucous membrane. They're going to line... Remember, they're lining passages that open to the external environment. They're digestive passages, respiratory, urinary, and reproductive tracts. They consist of two or three layers. The epithelium, which is this layer of epithelial cells. In this case, what type were they? Ooh, I might call these pseudostratified. They have goblet cells, and we've got a mucus coating, the mucus being secreted by the goblet cells. All of these epithelial cells lay on a basement membrane. And below the basement membrane is an area we call the lamina propria. The lamina propria is predominantly areolar connective tissue. These membranes have absorptive, secretory, and protective functions. We'll take a look at the other types of membranes, like the cutaneous membrane, the synovial membranes, and serous membranes, as we make our way through the rest of this course. So this concludes our section. So this concludes the lecture section on intercellular junctions, glands, and membranes. Let's now move on to tissue growth, development, repair, and death.